Hi and welcome to ECCB Connects. This week, we explore the region's readiness to reopen its borders and the future of tourism in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Stay with us. We'll be back after this message. EC Polymer Notes, our new money. Here's how you can detect genuine EC Polymer Notes. Feel. Polymer notes feel smoother than the material from which paper notes are made. Also, the front of each note has raised bumps at the top left-hand corner. These bumps form shapes that are familiar to you. Look. Look for the clear window at the front and back of each note. This window allows you to see through the notes. If you hold the notes up to the light, you'll see the value of the note in an area of plain colored print. Tilt. A holographic foil is on the $100, $50, and $20. The images move and their colors change when you tilt the notes. Remember, detecting genuine EC Polymer notes is as easy as one, two, three. Feel, look, and tilt. EC Polymer notes. Cleaner, safer, stronger. Thank you for staying connected. Tourism is one of the main contributors to the economies of the countries of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. Governor of the ECCB, Timothy N.J. Antwine, has made the point that the recovery of the region's economies is linked to the recovery of the tourism industry. But is it wise for countries to open their borders at this time to get tourism back on track? On this program, we share with you excerpts from the ECCB Digital Dialogues, which focused on pandemic and tourism, the Honorable Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Alan Shastany, and tourism expert Vincent Vanderpool Wallace will discuss the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the tourism sector, the protocols and prospects for safely reopening and the future of tourism. The governor of California likened what we were going through to um, a light switch. And what he said is, is that the worst thing to try to do is to deal with this with an on and off switch. And that this really requires us to have a dimmer switch. So it, there is no definitive answer on any one day to anything. It's not either yes or no. Um, the dimmer switch allows you to always adjust the lights to where you, it needs to be. And so the information is changing daily. I mean, who, who, would have, who would have expected Black Lives Matter marches to go on for 26 days in America? And what impact has that had on the increase in the number of cases that are taking place? Um, you know, the conflict in the states as to whether to open or whether to close, the, the ability of individual states to be able to make those decisions by themselves. There are so many um, intangibles. Right. Now, I would not want to know what I would have to do when I woke up in the morning confronted with the fact that I have 80 cases of COVID and I have community members calling me to say to me, prime minister, my auntie is dying and she needs to get on a ventilator and you need to help me because if you don't help me, she's going to die. We've not had to make that choice and that's the reality. And so as bad as it is, Governor, it could be worse. Indeed. It could be worse. And so, so for me, it's not so complicated. And that's why I say sometimes, and the Lord, you know, uh, I sit down on my knees and pray. I do. And I, I realize that October is not that far away. So if the choice is that we have to open up the economy without having any levels of controls and literally throw out, the, out of the door everything that we have learned till now and take the risk that we get cases and now we have even a bigger battle on our hands. I'd rather stay the way I am and I'd rather go house to house, institute more prayer in our country, get everybody to understand that we are each other's brother's keepers and that we all have to help each other out during this very difficult period. But certainly to open up our countries when we know the limitations that we have in dealing with an outbreak. We could not cope with what took place in New York. We could not cope with what took place in Italy. We cannot cope with what's taking place in some other parts of the world, Brazil, 
um, Argentina, Peru. We can't cope with that government. And so I can say to you as the Prime Minister of San Lucia, I am not prepared to just open up the door. I am prepared to go through a phase basis. I am prepared to be able to work on the basis of science and numbers and statistics and understand what the exposure is going to be and that we're going to make decisions collectively together. But I can say to you, I don't lose any sleep over the dilemma as to whether I have to open up my doors because uh, I'm certainly one of those that believes that the Caribbean and particularly Governor, your OECS has shown um, how mature we are and in terms of how we've handled the situation. And I do not think that we should throw away or, or waste that success that we've had. You know, and, I, and just to add a little bit, uh, um, uh, Governor, you see, the one thing that's underlying all of this discussion, and particularly when we start talking about North America, every single piece of research I've seen in the last six months uh, has said the number one desired place for people to travel internationally from North America today, uh, before the pandemic, in the pan and especially in the pandemic, is the Caribbean. So we have sitting here, I think, the greatest demand. The, the one way for us to screw that up is to all of a sudden, and, and by the way, there is, a, there is an intuitive belief that islands can control these pandemics far better than, for example, states. There is no boundary around a state that allows people to uh, um, stop at the border and be admitted. So it's, it's almost an impossible situation in the United States where interstate travel allows people to move around. I mean, the best analogy I ever heard in my entire life, somebody said, is like having a, um, a blanking section in a swimming pool. Uh, there is no such thing because it contaminates the whole thing. But an island, and St. Lucia is an outstanding example of that, can contain it. But the one thing that we've learned through all of this is that you know, there is no plan that survives first contact with reality. You got to be prepared to learn from what you just did and then be nimble and flexible in managing it. And the idea, and forgive me for beating this horse for a long time, the idea is simple. You have to open up gradually and learn from it. Then you decide what you're going to do. But to just to throw the doors open is, I, I think, is pretty reckless and irresponsible. As a new face of tourism emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic, the panelists agree that it is time to promote and incentivize intra-regional travel. Vantapol Wallace also believes that tax-free or low-tax travel within the region is a good starting point. The, the simple fact is that when we add all of the taxes on both ends of that trip, uh, the, the taxes on the round trip, the Bahamas and the Caribbean and the rest of the, uh, our region has some of the highest price per mile flown of anybody in the world. And in too many cases, it's less expensive to fly to Miami or somewhere else outside the region than it is to fly within the region. I have always believed, and until I'm proven wrong, that one of the biggest untapped markets for the Caribbean is the Caribbean itself. And to the degree we can begin to have low price airfares within our region, I think it's going to stimulate uh, travel in the region. I think it's going to increase occupancies. I think you're going to find a lot more business being done within the region. I think we're going to get more people in the region coming to understand other sides of the region. But at the end of the day, I recognize that when you look at the tax collection on the, um, the, 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 from the airline tickets by countries, it's significant. But the point I will always make, if you take a look at the induced and indirect taxes that people spend after they get into the country, going back to the Prime Minister's point about satellite accounting, I will wager that those collection of taxes are greater than the tax that we will forego on the front end on the ticket side. So I think one of the great ways of stimulating it has always been for us to begin to take a look at the taxes on tickets within the region. I'm not talking about taxes on tickets from the United States, from Canada, from the UK. I'm just talking within the region. Prime Minister Chastanay says not only is there a need for low tax travel within the region, 
but there needs to be some much deeper radical changes. So let's take the OECS, 750,000 people. If you include Barbados, a million people. Islands that are dependent on air traffic. The Bahamas is 350,000 people, multiple islands. So how is it that the Bahamas has, um, and Vincent, please correct me if I'm wrong. The last time you told me this, there was around 25 um, airlines, Bahamian airlines traveling within the Bahamas. And that there was eight um, charter companies and five cargo companies. Relative to the, what do we have in OECS Barbados? We have one airline and two charter companies and now one helicopter company. That's it. How is that possible? And it's possible because we have an overly regulated sector and one in which it is being manipulated to protect one airline rather than allowing for the market to, to take care of itself. Why, why do I have to go to a, an airport two hours beforehand to go to Barbados or a 15 minute flight to Martinique? How is it that the airfare to go to Martinique from St. Lucia, which is 15 miles, is the same price as me going to Miami? And it's because market forces are not being able to take place. We're not allowing freedom of competition. We're not allowing airlines to bring in the kinds of planes that they want because anybody who brings in planes that are going to be too competitive against Liat, they've been stopped. I can say that. I know that firsthand. So what you need to fly between Martinique and St. Lucia and St. Lucia to Dominique and St. Lucia to St. Vincent is a non-pressurized plane. There's no, there's no financial model that allows that to happen. You go to Belize. I think the population of Belize, if I'm not mistaken, Governor, is 350,000 people, I think it is. Or is it 250? Yeah. I think it's three, about 350. Yeah, that you was. have two airlines, Maya and Tropical, <clears throat> who make money every year and fly over, was it 300 flights a day using caravans, non-pressurized planes, that you can fly the same distances we're, we're talking about for 50 US dollars. And so that we must treat as Vincent said, traveling within CARICOM is flying in within domestic space. We don't have to emulate everybody else. And what was causing us to have to put in all these security standards and everything else is because many of our terminals are commingled, meaning that we have international flights and domestic flights. And so there has to be a mechanism of creating a smaller terminal to deal with domestic flights in order that we can now have our own protocols but it is an indictment against all of us. Can't sit in a room, accept what some of the facts are and resolve it because people bring their own agenda and I don't blame them, that's life all over. They bring these agendas to the table and that the ultimate goal of now trying to increase traffic within our region becomes secondary. And there are a whole bunch of other agendas which are not put on the table, which are dominating the scene. So I am for one, I would shut down ECHA I am not a believer in ECHA. How can OECS afford to have one civil aviation authority? So let's count it. OECS has a civil aviation authority. Barbados has a civil aviation authority. Trinidad has a civil aviation authority. Guyana has a civil aviation authority. Suriname has a civil aviation authority. Jamaica has its own civil aviation authority. Belize has its own civil aviation authority. Really? To do what? <laughs> to regulate? to make sure pilots have their proper certification, make sure planes, I mean, it's absurd. And think of all those costs that's, that's in that. And then everybody has to justify their job by showing that they're in charge of their territory and making travel even more complicated. And so until we're prepared to actually sit down, treat CARICOM as a singular zone, as Vincent was saying, and it's not just about the taxation, it's about all the other stuff. To view any episode of ECCB Connects anytime, any place at your convenience, check us out on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn at ECCB Connects. That brings us to the end of another episode of ECCB Connects. Thank you for watching. 
We invite you to connect with us next week for another program.